Hello everyone, and welcome to the SGD Show, where I will talk about anything and everything that I find interesting. Today's show, I'll be discussing the classic Doctor outfits through the years, but first we're going to cover the news. So, news for today, we'll start with Formula One. <clears throat> so, in the last week, Red Bull have dropped their car. Now, testing has begun. I'm going to do a separate episode on testing, which will probably be out on Monday. Now, the car itself, uh, like I always say, I'm, I'm not particularly technically minded. I have a look at them and I can see if there's a major difference. The two things that I can see with the Red Bull, um, the side pod is, is, is kind of taken a lot of a lot of attention as they've kind of adopted the, the, the kind of as small as possible side pod that Mercedes tried to make work for a year and a half, which is quite interesting. It's interesting to see that they kind of tried to go with that concept. But the big thing that no one's really talked about yet is if you have a look at the sides of the halo, that's very, very raised. And it's raised the whole way to the back of the car. And I haven't seen any other car do that or have that feature on it. Um, I can only assume that's to help direct airflow to the rear wing to give the most dominant car ever more rear downforce um but one of the things that both adrian well not adrian but red bull in general have have said is they've done a lot to this car it is an evolution not a revolution but they have done a lot to the car because and i think when you look at the back end of last year and just how close mclaren was to them I think if Red Bull didn't try a lot, they probably would have got overtaken this year by someone. Um, but again, if the concepts don't work, Red Bull will find themselves not winning the championship. It's, it's as simple as that. Even though you can be dominating one year, the year after you can absolutely, absolutely struggle to to maintain a championship challenge. Um, I've been many times through the years, most famously with Ferrari. In 2001 and 2002, they were absolutely beyond dominant. In 2003, they only won the championship like one or two points with Schumacher. Same in 2005, no, 2005 they lost, didn't they? Maybe 2001 was closer than I remember. 2003 was close anyway. Um, yeah, so it is very, very possible that Red Bull will not remain class of the field. But I would be surprised. I'd be very, very surprised. Uh, obviously, we'll see. We'll see how testing goes. Testing, well, you know, never care about lap times. They are almost irrelevant. But you're looking at a lot of other. You know, you're kind of relying on a lot of the pundits telling you about how things are looking through corners and straights and whatnot. There's obviously paddock chatter, which does make. Um, I was going to say it makes a difference. It's not about making a difference. It's just uh, you, you can, you can tell. So that is the Red Bull. Uh, the other thing that's kind of been announced, and I didn't know this was happening, was a new Formula 2 car, uh, which looks horrible. It looks absolutely horrible. Um, the rear wing is one of the ugliest rear wings I think I've ever seen in a Formula car. The side pods, in comparison to what Formula 1's doing now, look bizarre and huge and boxy. Uh, the front wing is absolutely bizarre. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, in so it's got this massive, like, bottom section, massive, which is attached to the tip of the nose, and goes all the way up the side, and then there's two winglets, I mean, big winglets, uh, comprising the rest of the front nose. Um, it's not the most attractive card Lara have ever made. I thought I'd go as far as to say as it's probably the ugliest they've ever made. I think that is absolutely, I think it's a revolting card to look at. Um, but hey, as long as it races well, as long as it still keeps from the two interesting in the racing close, because that is what is important. Uh, Formula 2 is a brilliant category of motor racing, so hopefully this doesn't drastically change it too much. And the Formula 3 car is remaining, well, I'm pretty sure it's exactly the same. I think they're getting a medium tyre instead of just a soft and hard. But the design of that is still gorgeous and shark finny and kind of reminiscent of the 2000 and... 17 car so eurovision news then <clears throat> now israel again this is the topic that isn't really going to go away until israel basically confirm that they're not participating um which i think is coming i think they know i think the ebu know they're just waiting to see what the song is before they do anything about it at this stage the rumor is that it's a song called october rain 
which is a song that will be that will be politically charged about the Hamas attack on the seventh of October. Now, I unfortunately one of the one of the for the defenders of a song like that in Eurovision, they point to nineteen forty four and the fact that it won. Now, I hate the fact that it won. Absolutely hate it. Because for about six or seven years prior to that winning, I was adamant that the contest was not political. And after 2016, I've had to, you know, I can't I can't really defend that it's not political anymore, especially with Ukraine's on in 2022. <clears throat> it's annoying that Ukraine has had three wins, two of which were political, but Ukraine deserved three or four wins, just not necessarily with the songs they had. 1944. For those that don't know, or have forgotten, is a song about Jamala's grandmother uh, in 1944 when Russia annexed Crimea in 1944. Now, that came out in 2016. Now, if that sounds similar to Russia annexing Crimea in 2013-2014, unfortunately, you're absolutely wrong because the song is called 1944. So it's about 1944, and that's the end of it. So because it, because they could use that as a, no, nah, look, it's got nothing to do with that. When strangers are coming, they come for your house, they kill you all and say we're not guilty. Yeah, not politically charged in any way, shape or form. <clears throat> it did my head in that it got to Eurovision. It broke my heart that it won. Uh, ironically, I think Russia's entry that year was by far and away the best. And they had a they had a victory robbed from them in the same way that in 2008 they stole a victory from any other potential victor so <clears throat> yeah i think to say that the contest isn't politically charged is wrong and for the ebu to try and say that uh, that they that they that it's not is nonsense there is a statement actually that i found from 2022 when they announced that russia uh wouldn't be participating uh, the executive board of the EBU made the decision following a recommendation earlier today by the Eurovision Song Contest governing body, the reference group based on the rules of the event and the values of the EBU, that's the European Broadcasting Union, not the EU. The reference group recommendation was also supported by the EBU's television committee. The decision reflects concern that in light of the unprecedented crisis in Ukraine, the inclusion of a Russian entry in this year's contest would bring the competition into disrepute because having Israel and definitely wouldn't. Before making this decision, the EBU took time to consult widely among its membership. The EBU is an apolitical member, my arse, organization of uh, broadcasters committed to upholding the values of public service. We remain dedicated to protecting the values of a cultural competition which promotes international exchange and understanding, brings audiences together, celebrates diversity through music and unites Europe on one stage. Now, I don't remember there being an open letter with 400 people, including including uh, like Helen Mirren, saying that Russia should still be allowed to participate in Eurovision 2022 and that... <coughs> Uh, just because they're Russian, they shouldn't be persecuted for it. But that didn't happen. And this is much the same. Like I said, I'm not going to get into, this is not the podcast for getting into the the gory, grisly, horrific details of the 80-year Israel-Palestinian war. If you want to know about it, look it up. This is not the place for it. What bugs me is there are two separate rules being used here for two separate countries and that does my head that absolutely does my head in i as far as i'm concerned both russia and israel should be in eurovision they absolutely should if the contest is not political they should be in eurovision the fact that russia went to war with ukraine i mean we went to war with iraq for no reason and we came last that year and it was embarrassing that we be in the United Kingdom. Like, was there a safety issue potentially? Like, obviously in 2017, 2017 was another absolute farce where Ukraine said that, you know, if you've ever if you've performed in Crimea since the annexation, you're not allowed in the country, you're barred from the country. So Russia obviously picked up a, a singer who had, who had performed in Crimea and she was absolutely rubbish as she proved in 2018 when she didn't qualify Russia's only non-qualification because she was absolute mince so like it's one of those where Russia does you know they make decisions which are absolutely bizarre with their selections sometimes 
Um, but to ban the, the country entirely and then here we are two years later and we're not banning Israel is just it begs belief it absolutely begs belief now obviously the defendants of Israel are well they were attacked they're just retaliating but I think after four months of killing innocent people that's that's probably enough right <clears throat> anyway um if they do pick October rain, they will be banned. They will absolutely be banned. There is no way you can, you know, a 20 year old can say, well, my grandmother was a victim of an attack in 1944. Also, if you're calling it October rain, like, come on, Israel. Anyway, let's move on to happier things. So, a uh, few entries uh, were picked this week Germany, Poland, Moldova, uh, Estonia, Lithuania, Denmark, and Belgium. We'll start with the German entry from Isaac, which is always on the run. There's a cheeky swear in there, which they bleeped on the official Eurovision channel, which I think is fun. The background is lovely. Uh, it's good staging. It's a good voice. The song is fine. It's good. Probably will get lost on the night, dependent on position. Germany don't have the best track record at Eurovision uh, for the past few years. They have a couple of absolute standouts, like, um, oh, what was the dude that was singing about his dad? Michael something, 2018. Oh, that's going to bug me. That's going to bug me. I'm going to have to look that up. That's going to absolutely bug me if I don't remember that. It came like fourth. It, I mean, it was an absolutely gorgeous, 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 gorgeous song. Uh, Germany, 2018 Eurovision. What was it? You Let Me Walk Alone. I was born from one. Yeah, perfect. Gorgeous song. Absolutely gorgeous song. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's not that. I don't think Germany have sent in a song as good as that since satellite really or, or i mean taken by a stranger is really good as well um it's also the melody isn't a million miles away from uh north macedonia sent an entry called autumn leaves and i think 2015 and it's pretty similar to the original version of that i, I don't think it'll do that well but hey ho uh poland your entry is luna with the tower and um, the Polish friend of mine described it as a watered down Iceland from last year. Now, I had to admit, I didn't remember Iceland from last year, and I had to look it up, and I watched it, and I thought, yep, pretty accurate. But it's an improvement over it. Bama. Well, I mean, I think it is anyway. But, uh, I mean, that managed it through the televote last year, so, I mean, who knows? I, when it comes to Poland, it seems like either they don't qualify, or they qualify and absolutely smash the televote and end up in the top ten. Uh Sometimes deservedly, like um, with Captain Hook, what's his name, Michal Spack, uh, with color, color of, color of your life, yeah, I, which I, which is one of my favorite Polish entries ever. Not my absolute favorite, but one of, uh, yeah. So I mean, it's either it'll not qualify or it'll come top ten. That, that seems to be, you know, Poland doesn't do things by halves. Uh, Moldova's entry, Natalia Barbu in the middle, very odd staging. Don't understand why the violins are there they're barely used when they are used they're not that interesting or fun there are two microphones which just feels like a really rubbish version of uh think about things as staging nah, i don't I, just, I don't get the staging at all in any way shape or form the lyrics as is often the case with moldova are questionable but they made a song about a train that reopening an absolute bop so you know i, I, I never really question that too much but it's a catchy-ish chorus but i mean fight was better and it feels like it's it feels like it's missing a water bowl and a Meghan Markle reference. And the up the octave section at the end is just not good. I, I don't know. I think Moldova have completely missed the mark with this. But uh, yeah, I, I again, I'm not. When it comes to the Eastern European countries, I'm I'm never too sure whether they will or won't qualify. It's not always necessarily about quality. A lot of it is to do with well, who's voting in that semi final. Um, and, and you know, position, only five or six songs don't qualify these days, so it's, you don't have to stand out too much to get through, you just have to not be the worst. Moldova might not be the worst, especially when we look to Estonia's entry. By Five Minushed and Pulup, Nidesh Narkuti Midesht, Etime Kul Midagi. I've probably got that wrong, so apologies to any Estonian listeners. Is it the longest song title in Eurovision ever? Damn right it is. Uh, it's the second year in a row that Ollie, I think, was robbed. I don't remember Estonia's entry last year, but Venom was way better. I will not remember this entry. I don't think um, my friend was better than Venom, but I think my friend was better than this. 
Um, but you know, a story I've listened to, Love, Love, Peace, Peace, eight years late, and uh, you know, they've included some some interesting instruments. Look, not all songs can get to the final, and this gives me We Are the Winners and Eastern European Funk vibes. But I don't think it's anywhere near as good. I don't think it's as catchy. I ugh, I'm just, like I said about Moldova, you just have to not be like the worst in your final, and I think Estonia is. And I, I will be stunned if we see that in the final. I really will. And then we compare that to Lithuania, who have sent probably their best entry in about eight years. Definitely their best. Uh, both the Donnie Montels are amazing, and this is right up there. It's right up my street. So it's by Sylvester Belt, and it's called Luke Dell. Uh, yeah, it, like I say, it's right up my street. It's uh, gorgeous, gorgeous staging. Beautiful staging. So it's a really, really catchy song. It's like a more dancier EDM version of... Um, it knocked its rhythm inside for Belgium a few years ago, which did really, really well. I think it could do well, you know, I really do. Uh, it leans into like pure trance for 10 seconds and then it just remains EDM for the last 30. Oh, I love it. Like I said, it's, it's right up my street. Um, it's not my favourite, but it's in my top three. Potentially top five once everything else is has, has been revealed. I hope it gets the final. I reckon as long as he as long as they don't change too much, this could be top ten. I really, really do. Denmark. Saba with sand. It's my favourite Danish entry since Rasmussen and Higher Ground. I love it with a burning passion. I'm worried that like uh like paper it will be lost kind of on a general audience just because you know you make me feel like paper. You cut right through. Like the, the sentiment of that song was really, really good. But when your when your main vocal point is you're singing the word paper, and the main vocal point of this is you're singing the word sand, I'm I'm worried it will come across a bit daft. Uh, hopefully it doesn't. I really hope it doesn't. The staging is simple, um, powerful. The singer is amazing. The song is gorgeous. The melody is beautiful. The chorus is un unreal. Uh, I mean, I. I'd love if it was top five or, you know, even in contention for the win, but I think realistically it'll qualify, but it'll probably struggle to get at the bottom five. I hope I'm wrong. I really do hope I'm wrong. Uh, Belt of Entry is Misty before the party's over. Um, the first half I thought it might be a bit of a jury favourite, but then it just kind of fizzles out and nothing really changes. It's two minutes the same thing, and then it's what I, what I thought was going to be a, a bridge ended up just being the rest of the song. Uh, yeah, maybe it'll be, maybe it'll be better live, and you know, hopefully he wears some more clothes in Malmo. So that is the Eurovision news. Uh, let's like say a lot of entries. Uh, actually, a fair few entries. Um, yeah, I think I'll probably like what I'm going to do with Formula One. I'm going to do. A, I'm going to do a separate podcast to cover testing. Uh, and anything interesting that's happened up to that point, I might just mix in, mix in with something else. And once all the Eurovision entries are released, uh, if we get a running order, great. If not, fine. Um, but I will probably go through all of them, and not 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 going to say more detail, but I'll go through all of them, and I'll go through, uh, my my scoring system as well. Yeah, and we will, we'll come to that when we come to it. Now to the main part of the podcast, which is classic Doctor outfits. Now I was going to do just every Doctor outfit. Um, once I'd got through all the classic ones, I was like, okay, geez, this is going to be this is going to be a fair amount. Once I'd finished David Tennant's first season, <laughs> and realised that he pretty much has a variation of his outfit every episode, I was like, nah, okay, this is going to need to be split into two. So. This is going to be classic one. Next week we'll do the New Who ones. Classic will run up to Paul McGann in the TV movie. New Who will run from Eccleston up to Shuti Gatwa. I haven't decided whether I'm going to include uh, official photos of him in different outfits or not yet. I probably will. Can't see why I wouldn't. They're all gorgeous. So let's start with Mr. Hartnell. Now, this is an absolute classic look. I just, I'm gonna, 
Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so the first Doctor outfit then. Now, this remains pretty much unchanged for his entire run. There are a couple of uh, different outfits for historicals. But, yeah, so we have... I also think in the pilot he's just wearing, like, a normal suit. But I haven't included that because that was that was officially an unaired pilot. It didn't get aired until 1991. Yeah, so we have got the gorgeous suit jacket. We have the little kind of blue, it's not really a bow tie, is it? It's just kind of there. Uh, waistcoat, stripes, like, um, what's the name of the, like, Swedish trousers? I don't know if they are tweed or not, but I mean, they look tweedy. Uh, yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous little shirt as well. And he's got his little walking cane. I mean, it's, it's, there's not a lot to discuss. It is just the Doctor. And it was, you know, for a very, very long time that's what the doctor wore that that was just what his outfit was there's nothing particularly spectacular or or, or mind-blowing but i guess for the time it would have been you know 1963 seeing your main character wandering around in that would be you know pretty pretty cool i suppose and uh, now the next one that i am gonna have a little look at is the outfit that he wears in the aztecs I mean, I say outfit, it's basically just like one big, long, brown thing. I mean, do you know what is there? <clears throat> That's pretty much the only the only other... Well, there are a couple more. Like, there's the one that he wears in the Reign of Terror, which is just gorgeous. It's very, very colourful. Uh, for the life of my character, it's French, isn't it? Reign of Terror is about the... The uprising. Anyway... <clears throat> And it's beautiful. It's you know, it's got the the red, white, and the blue. It's got the sash. It's got the little medal. He's got the little white glove on. The the paucity of the hat with the big, big massive feather in it. It's good. It's a it's a fun little outfit. And then there's what he wears in the Romans. Now, what he wears in the Romans, I think, is beautiful. Again, I'm not a particularly fashion oriented person, but I know what I like. I know what looks. I know what I think looks good, and I think this looks good. It's very very kind of whenever. The BBC does historicals, they do them well. And think to put the Doctor in, uh, like, accurate, like, 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 clothing that's actually from that period, I think it, I think it almost always works. I say almost, but I can't actually think of a time where it doesn't. Because it's the Doctor, you can put the Doctor in pretty much anything. I'm literally like the thing that my mind goes to is uh, the Twelfth Doctor's outfit for the Frost Fair in Thin Ice. Because that's just unbelievably beautiful. The Eleventh Doctor's outfit in uh, The Snowmen as well. That is gorgeous. Like Willy Wonka esque. Anyway, yeah. <clears throat> this was more like historically accurate and it's, it looks great. It looks absolutely great. And then we move to the Second Doctor, whose outfit never changes he's got the big fully he's got the big fur coat which he wears uh occasionally but his outfit is pretty much just a i want to say watered down version of the first doctors but it's it's like a almost like a more casual instead of the kind of like almost like cravat sort of thing it's just a little dicky bow and I'm pretty sure it is just a little dicky bow, not a bow tie. Yeah, little dicky bow. He's almost always got that. I mean, as you can see here, we've got the recorder. <clears throat> he's holding the 500 year diary. Uh, he's got the blue shirt underneath, and he's got the the trousers, which have a similar-ish pattern, but they're baggier and they're not as they're not as um. What's the word I'm looking for? I want to say proper. Screw it, I'm going to say proper. And the jacket's more or less the same, but again, it's it's like they've taken all the stuff from the first Doctor and just made it a little looser, a little baggier, a little bit, you know, less form-fitting and regal and a bit more fun, as uh, as the first Doctor describes describes this particular incarnation. as he's, he's a clown. I don't necessarily think clown is the right way to describe the outfit, uh, certainly with on top of Patrick Troughton's portrayal, I get it. Um, but on the outfit itself, it's it's just a, a variation, I would say, on Hartnell's. 
And then we get to John Pertwee. And uh, this is where <clears throat> a vast majority of the differences occur. Pertwee had an absolute eye for fashion. He loved his style. The Twelfth Doctor mimics parts of it, but not all of it. And I think I think Pertwee is the best dressed doctor in the classic era. But by a country mile. By an absolute country. I don't think all of the outfits are a hit, but most of them are. And the very, very first one absolutely is. So we've got the white uh, frilly shirt underneath. We've got the big black bow tie, an actual bow tie, not a dicky bow. We've got the black suit jacket and we've got the black cape that's got the red lining in it, which he is holding up with his, you know, arms up high, holding the cape in to make it just look absolutely gorgeous. It's stunning. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, to the point where they don't actually vary it in that first season. They keep that the same the whole season. The only time the third Doctor's wearing something different is when he's in the cave, like the cave outfit, uh, Splunking, I should call it, in Doctor Who and the Celerians. And he, you know, he, he doesn't really look like the Doctor there. He looks like John Pertwee wearing, <laughs> wearing some work series. Um, but I mean, it's it's... That's fine. I think it's one of those where it's worth a mention because it's there. It's not really a Doctor outfit in as much as it is, you know, I haven't included John Pertwee uh, as a as a, a cleaning lady. Maybe I should have done. Maybe I'll go find that. Eh. We'll have a laugh with love. <clears throat> so the first major variation comes in Terror of the Autumns, where we have what I think is Pertwee's, for me personally, is Pertwee's signature look. It's not necessarily a signature look. There's there's a few others which I think suit him better. But when I think of Pertwee's Doctor, there are two variations that come to mind. Uh, I think the first episode I ever watched with the third Doctor was the Time Warrior. So that variation, which we'll come to, which is like the, a green version, is kind of what I think of with Pertwee's Doctor. Um, as like a, not childhood memory, I can't remember when I watched it, but certainly when I think of the Doctor now, I think of this photo here where he's standing with his, you know, hands on hips. He's got the white frilly shirt. He doesn't have a bow. Does he have a bow tie on? No, he doesn't have a bow tie on. He's got the red uh, velvet smoking jacket, which is just gorgeous. And he's got a cape again, but instead of it being black with red lining, it's black with purple lining. Purple being my favourite colour, that being my favourite cape, this being my favourite variation, I think, of Pertwee's outfit. Um, I think when they redid Tom's outfit for season 18, this is the colour palette they took and that is, like, that's one of my all-time favourite Doctor Who outfits, Tom's, Tom's final season. It's just, I think it's beautiful, but I'm jumping the gun a bit. Yeah, I think that is, I think that is just an absolutely gorgeous look. And then for a Claws of Axos, we go back to the, like, the black, um, the black smoking jacket. Again, white frilly shirt, no bow tie. Uh, looks like we've got a cape there. Is that, like, a orange or, like, a slightly more pattern underlining? <clears throat> Almost all of these with black shoes and, and black trousers as well. Uh, the next slight variation, I would say, comes for the demons. All of this in the same season, season eight. <clears throat> the only real de uh, devi deviation, the only real difference here being that we've got some gloves on and we've got a bow tie on. It also looks like the cape has like a blue lining, but that could just be the hue of the photo. I think that's probably the purple lining because he's wearing the red uh, smoking jacket as well. The next uh, slight variation comes with the Day of the Daleks. Again, we've got more or less the same, except the cloak that he's the like cape that he's wearing so again we've got the red you know the red velvet smoking jacket the white shirt looks like we've not got a bow tie on nope and um, but the cape instead of it being a black outline it's a tartan outline uh with red underlining small change but you know worth a mention uh now the next one i think this is this is peladon i think this is curse of peladon where we've got uh, I'm wearing basically like a like an overcoat, a black overcoat 
with a red bow tie over the top. He's got the gloves on again. Uh, and we've got the cape, which is again black and I think is the purple lining. Unless that's a rock. That could just be a rock. It's tough to tell. I don't think this is a particularly good look for the Doctor. It makes him look a bit bog. It makes him look a bit big and chunky and it, it's uh, that's not a good that's not a good look that. I don't think that's a good look. Not for Purpose Doctor anyway. No. This is something which I think is very, very fun to see. The first, the second, and the third Doctors together. So the first Doctor is uh, still played by the inimitable William Hartnell, looking wildly different from his last appearance seven years prior, six years prior? I think six years prior. Uh, the outfit remains more or less unchanged, not that you can really tell. I'm um, pretty sure the waistcoat was yellow in the originals, and here it is it's just like a cream colour. Um, he doesn't. You don't really get to see him in his entirety because, bless him, because of his poor, uh, because of his poor health, he is just kind of a vision on a screen, and you only really get the top half. Second Doctor, I think the Dicky Bow. I think the Dicky Bow might change a few times during the Second Doctor's run, but you can't tell because it's in black and white. But the Dicky Bow looks has got a different pattern here, um, and I think his trousers are different as well. But I can't find just a regular photo. Maybe. Do you know what? Let's go have a little look. See if I can find a photo with his trousers. And I'm glad I did, because they are definitely different. As is his shirt, as his shirt's blue. How fun. So he's got a blue shirt on. I mean, again, he might be wearing a blue shirt for the entirety of his actual run. Um, but the trousers are looking a little bit more proper. They're looking a bit less baggy. They're very, very, very high-waisted. Uh, yeah, that I mean that's that's second Doctor through and through. It's a it's a pretty good look. Um, and then we have the third Doctor variation, where we've got the red smoking jacket back and the white frilly shirts. Uh, we've got a smaller maroon bow tie, and a cape again, black outlining, uh, with blue underlining, which is a very very nice look. I understand they've gone for blue underlining and a bright blue shirt for Patrick Troughton as well. Hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> looks really, really good. I think they look really, really good together as well. Uh, then we have, I think the Green Death is the first appearance of the green variation of the outfit, where it, is, it looks less like a velvet smoking jacket and more just like a green suit jacket. And he's got a kind of like a murky grey frilly shirt on with a dark, could it be black, could it be red? Who knows? Uh, bow tie on. We then have uh, Frontier. Oh, well, this is Frontier in Space, so that other one must be Carnival of Monsters. So Frontier in Space, <clears throat> again, we've got kind of a long trench coat, which looks like it's just over the top of the previous episode's uh, outfit. I mean, the, the bow tie looks the same, the frilly shirt looks the same. You can just see the like fragments of the green, of the green potential smoking jacket. But yeah, you've got that big kind of ugly trench coat over. I don't think I don't think Pertwee's Doctor suits that trench coat at all in any way, especially not buttoned up. But I, yeah, it's fine. Uh, we then have the only appearance that I could see of this kind of like burgundy pink variation of his outfit, which was for uh, Planet of the Daleks. That was definitely Frontier in Space. It's not really flat of the Daleks. Yeah, must be. <clears throat> um, yeah, so it's uh, it's like a darker maroon smoking jacket, which is fully buttoned up, pink frilly shirt underneath, with a brownish bow tie. Uh, I, I mean, he just looks like when the first Doctor calls the third Doctor a dandy. Like he's not wrong. He is. Uh, he's a very very well dressed man. And then we have what I think might be just the most beautiful version of the outfit where we've got the black smoking jacket with red lining, with gorgeous red lining, uh, kind of musky blue frilly shirt underneath. Looks like he's got a red waistcoat under there as well, and a lovely maroon bow tie. Oh, it's beautiful. I, I could look at that for a very, I think that is an absolutely beautiful jacket. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, for the Time Warrior, <clears throat> so like I said, this is the this is the version of the of the third Doctor that I think of when I think of the third Doctor. Green smoking jacket, green bow tie, frilly white shirt, lovely. It's green, basically. It's green. Certainly the colour I associate with the third Doctor. 
uh, there is this variation. I can't remember what episode it's from, and it's it's kind of beautiful. The, the, the John Pro, I mean John Pro, looks great and everything. So this is a blue, a very rich blue smoking jacket with a light blue, pale blue frilly shirt underneath. You can just see a little watch there as well, and a bow tie of indiscriminate color, but I think black. Again, it's just vibrant and beautiful and gorgeous. I think this might be Invasion of the Dinosaurs. Like, it's just the stuff they got this man to wear is, oh, it's just absolutely sublime. Uh, and then we have Monster of Peladon with, um, I don't know, there's, some, there's something about this that doesn't, that I'm not the biggest fan of. So we've got the black, it's either black or, the, or like very, 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 very dark green smoking jacket on. A black waistcoat, a green frilly shirt, and a black bow tie. And we've got the traditional pocket watch there as well. Um, I don't know. There's something about it which I don't I don't particularly like. I can't quite put my finger on it. I think eh, it looks a bit it just looks a little bit like limey, and I'm not the biggest fan of lime green as a colour. I mean it literally just could be that. And then final appearance, Planet of the Spiders. Um, Pertweeb, so I'm looking a fair bit older in this episode actually. Uh, it looks like it's the black, but it could be a very, very, very no, it is black, isn't it? Yeah, black smoking jacket, <clears throat> light blue frilly shirt, black bow tie, and that is the final outfit of the third Doctor. He has a glorious range of outfits. They're all they're all basically variations on frilly shirt, bow tie, smoking jacket. But I think the different colour... Co I mean, and also, like, when we come to the Tenth Doctor next week, it's all variations on shirt, tie, waistcoat, uh, suit jacket. Like, it's all different variations. Um, but I love... I think I, I think I love that about, about Doctor's outfits. When you've got, right, this is the baseline that we're going with. Say, you know, it's going to be a smoking jacket a frilly shirt and a bow tie and then it's just about mixing color combinations up different designs to make it interesting week on week i love that i love that about the 10th doctor i love that about the third doctor the 11 has it a tiny tiny bit but they're not overly varied uh, and then it's not really until i mean 10 and 12 has it as well 12 has variations left right and center which is beautiful 13 didn't really have any variations 14 obviously just has the one and 15 looks like, 15 looks like there's not variations. 15 just looks like he'll wear anything and everything, which is glorious. Anyway, so we move then to the fourth Doctor. And this is the first time that we get a proper look at a Doctor in their previous incarnation's clothes. Now, there is one shot of the third Doctor in Patrick Troughton's outfit, falling out of the TARDIS. Uh, but I, I, I literally just couldn't find a good enough photo for it. I mean, and and also you see it for all of half a second and then he falls to the ground. So Tom Baker looking quite good in his predecessor's outfit. They have uh, rather interestingly removed the frilliness of the shirt. They have uh, taken off the bow tie. So it's really just a, almost like a plain white shirt and almost a plain black jacket. Uh, subtle changes, but I, I think good changes, if, if a touch lackey on the continuity side, but we have now had uh, a few Doctors, a few, we've now had a couple of Doctors regenerate um, and not change their clothes. And when you think about it, if you're going to explode in a big baptism explosion of streaming fire and energy, how the hell do your clothes survive that? <clears throat> it's Doctor Who, it's fine. I, I remember thinking when Jodie Whittaker regenerated into Tenant. Why on earth are the clothes changing? Oh, it must be something to do with the toy mate. And then they just never address it. And I realised I don't care. I actually don't care. I genuinely couldn't care less. Why do they change? Eh, why not? Why not? Why not? The Doctor literally splits himself into two and the two of them are wearing, you know, half of the outfit and poor shoes <laughs> and boxer shorts. Uh, uh, I love it. <clears throat> And, you know, the very first regeneration, first Doctor and the second Doctor, the outfit completely changes there. So that, that's, been, that's been canon for a very, very long time. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm not too fussed about it. It's, nice, it's, it's always fun and interesting to see the Doctor in the previous incarnation's outfit. 
Uh, the only time I think it doesn't work is Tenant. Bless him, he does not suit that leather jacket at all. But we'll come to that. Anyway, yeah, Tom Baker, looking fine. Uh, we then get these glorious variations. <laughs> so top left, we've got him. This is this is a scene where uh, I think he, I think the Doctor, and this is, this is, I've not seen Robot in a very, very long time. I think this is a scene where the Doctor, where the Doctor and the Brigadier are having a conversation. And the Brigadier's like, Doctor, you can't go out looking like that, as in what he looks like before he goes into the TARDIS. And the Doctor's like, oh, okay, I'll go in. And then he comes out wearing the Viking outfit, and the Brigadier's like, eh, maybe a bit more conspicuous, maybe a bit more, you know, I don't don't think that's quite right. And the Doctor's like, oh, really? Oh, well, okay. Anyway, yeah, I mean, I think, I think imagine the fourth Doctor wandering around as a Viking, or top right, like that. <laughs> Like the king in a in a in a pack of cards. I mean, it's beautiful. Look how vibrant the colours are on it. And then bottom left, there's not a lot of actors that can pull off a clown outfit, and uh, it looks really it's really good and sparkly. Um, I think when the brigadier says no to that one, if I remember right, uh, the doctor kind of frowns and holds his head down and turns around slowly, and there's a bit of funny music in the background. Um. And then he comes out in bottom right, which is just the not the, the the standard fourth doctor outfit. And the brigadier's like, right, that'll do. And the fourth doctor's like, are you sure? I can go back and change again. <laughs> because what what I love about the fourth doctor, and it's it's an element that we don't really get until uh, until fifteen, uh, is is this almost just the reverent? Uh, there's a big giant robot going and destroying stuff. Hmm. Am I wearing the right clothes? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, if, if if you don't think I look good, I'll go change it. But not in like a malicious, I don't care way. Especially here. But I mean, you get this throughout the fourth Doctor's entire run. There's, there's, a, there's a seed in Horrifying Rock and it just makes me chuckle because it's wonderful. Plus we've seen Invasion of Time. Horrifying Rock. Uh, he says that the quote is just wonderful. Uh, the slight house is under attack, and by morning we will all be dead. Big smile, because to 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 the to the doctor, that's like, you know, oh challenge. This is fun. This is interesting. Yeah, we might all be dead. Oh, <laughs> we won't be. Could be, and that's what I that's what I like. Now, for, <clears throat> Tom's detractors will say that it lessens the impact of the villain of that week. I disagree. I disagree completely. Um, I think you only have to look at episodes like uh, Deadly Assassin or Invasion of Time to see that there are things that, I mean, ironically, I've just put two Gallifrey episodes, uh, or even, you know, Logopolis, um, to a lesser degree, much lesser degree, Keeper of Trocken. But that's, you know, Genesis of the Daleks. You, I can pull so many episodes off the top of my head where the doctor is taking something very seriously and he is overwhelmed by the threat facing him just because most of the time he doesn't what i like about it is if most of the time you're almost passive when the fourth doctor is looking worried as an audience member you're going oh oh shit like now now, now we're screwed now we are screwed if that doctor's worried what what are we going to let ourselves in for? Like now we are buggered. Um, which I love. I I love I love that the fourth doctor is it's it's a brilliant trait. This is a much better uh full of the fourth doctor's outfit. So we've got the gorgeous brown hat. We've got the uh vibrant reds. I mean that might just be the color of this particular one. I'm pretty sure it's more burgundy and darker than that. Uh, jacket. We've got the long gorgeous multicolored scarf. We've got the, there's a shirt and a waistcoat and a, a, again, I think it's it's less of a tie, less of a cravat and more just like a, it's like a piece of cloth, which he just ties around his neck and put down. Can't really see his trousers here, but they're kind of like, um, what's the best way to describe them? I kind of, like, I think of them as, um, like, the, the, they're, they're like the, on very, very old TVs. Like the static that you'd get on TVs if if the if the if the signal wasn't right back, oh, back with signals or thing. The trousers look like that. I think I think they're kind of that like, um, spotty, grey like grey with with like, rounds kind of like little like rough spots all over it. 
there's a there's a better photo of the trousers a bit later on. Uh, next photo I've got here. So that that outfit he has he wears for the entire season. Uh, season 13, 13? No, 12. Season 12 uh, is one long story in the sense that every episode leads into the other one. So Robot leads directly into the Centauran experiment. No, sorry, uh, Ark in Space leads directly into the Centauran experiment, leads directly into Genesis of the Daleks, leads directly into Revenge of the Cybermen, in which the Doctor and companions uh, get back to... Uh, you know, current Earth and and uh, the TARDIS and whatnot. So, take the Zygons. First uh, variation on the Doctor's outfit. And because we're in Scotland, we've got a tartan scarf, we've got a gorgeous uh, tartan hat, and we've got a tartan waistcoat. You can't really see Harry's then wearing the scarf because there's a scarf up for grabs. And obviously, because it's Scotland, it's cold, he's wearing a big, chunky uh, brown overcoat as well. Uh, next variation comes a couple of episodes later. I mean, I say variation. Realistically, the the tie has changed. Uh, get, is it bow tie ish? I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, you also get to see get to think seeing the the fourth Doctor without the scarf is quite interesting. I always think he looks um, like he's got a shield down when he doesn't have the scarf on, which is quite cool. But yeah, nice scene without the without the scarf on, and then there's you know something else around his around his neck. Uh, now this is Pyramids of Mars, and I've looked at this because I think it very well could just be the the saturation of the photo, but it looks like it's a different colour jacket. But I think it might just be, I think it might just be the saturation. Interestingly, though, the mummy in the background looks looks. I mean, just I don't like the design of the mummy at all in this. Anyway, <clears throat> we got our first uh, big variation. In Mask of Mandragora, where again we've got the kind of little necktie, which is now uh, a lot redder. I think the scarf does go through a couple of variations, but trying to find the variations are, you know, I'm sure there's a photo somewhere which has, because that they vary in length. Yeah, there's not just one for six years. There are there are a couple of variations on it, and um, but then we have the the jacket, which is. Like a um, a light grey, and this is kind of the the texture and the look of what the trousers have been the whole time, that kind of uh, uh, like like television static, um, it's the best way to describe it I think, but everything else stays more or less the same. What well, gorgeous silhouette! I've I've just noticed that there's a kind of that tartan patterned waistcoat has come back, and it's just kind of a plain white shirt that he's wearing. But a lot of a lot of the fourth Doctor's uh, differences do come on, you know. It's the coat, it's the scarf, it's the hat, it's potentially a waistcoat, like shirt, tie, all that stuff kind of gets lost a bit in, uh, in, the other in the other things that he's wearing. This is, a, I think, maybe just a, a slightly better coloration. Uh, this is in, I mean, it looks like Brain of Morbius, but it can be. But it will obviously be Hand of Fear. <clears throat> uh, where, again, you just kind of get to see the outfit in, in its entirety, which is fine. Uh, then we have Deadly Assassin. Uh, one of my all-time favorite episodes. This, if not my, I mean, I think it's definitely my favorite classic episode. It's one I've seen countless times, and I love it more and more every time I see it. Now, <clears throat> in this, we've got the Doctor wearing uh, red burgundy trousers, and you see his boots, and he's just wearing the white shirt, and that's it. Now, I thought he looked vulnerable without the scarf. When you take away everything, I think the fourth Doctor looks almost naked, just but like extremely vulnerable. I think what I love about the Deadly Assassin is this is the Doctor almost at his most vulnerable. Uh, the fourth Doctor, I should say. Well, arguably he's at his most vulnerable when he's holding on for his life on a on a telephone pole. But I think this is him. It's a good personification, I think, especially when he goes into the Matrix. And it's like when he loses his, like, he just he loses the scarf as well. It's just like he, he loses a lot of, like, bits and tricks and stuff that he's got. And it's just him. No screwdriver, no, no gadgets, nothing. It's just the Doctor. Another reason why I love it. And then this is just him wearing, wearing some proper Time Lord garb uh, with a gorgeous headdress. 
uh, the Gallifreyan symbols stroke the Vork symbols. Yeah, beautiful. Fun story on them. I'll probably cover that another time. Uh, then we have the Talons of Wen Chiang, where the Doctor, um, for the first time, <laughs> not for the last time, wears a Sherlock Holmes inspired version of his uh, normal outfit. So he's got the Deerstalker cap on. Uh, I, love, I love the rifle that he's got. This is again one of those. This is the first instance I think of instead of the Doctor wearing accurate to the history outfit he wears a historical version of his outfit. So we've got, uh, you know, the coat is, I mean, what is that? Is that like spotted velvet? It's gorgeous. The waistcoat is, the waistcoat is beautiful as well. It's like, it's almost like a third doctor outfit, this. Um, Cause we've got a, what looks like a smoking jacket underneath with the same, it's like red with lighter red dots around it. Unless is that just the same as, that's just that thing. Cause that's like the cape. Okay, no. So the red, the red spotted stuff is the jacket, and then he's got that cape which comes over the front, like what the Third Doctor used to wear, which has got the grey and it's got that kind of interesting floral pattern on the inside, and then he's got the flower waistcoat and he's got a bright white uh, shirt on with a proper tie done up. That's a gorgeous look. That's a beautiful look. I wouldn't have minded if that had stuck around for a little while, but I guess you can't really get rid of the Fourth Doctor scarf, can you? Uh, and then we've got the Doctor's outfit where he's doing a punt in shadow. Uh, interestingly, it's the same waistcoat as Talons of Wen Chiang, uh, but he's got the hat on, he doesn't have, he's got the shirt on, and that's it. No other accoutrements, no tie, no scarf, no jacket. And then we come to, like I said earlier, <clears throat> my... Oh, I love it. My genuinely favourite version of his outfit, and potentially my favourite classic outfit, full stop. And the red... Uh, burgundy and purple variation from head to toe it's all one color scheme and it stays the same for the fourth doctor's last season season 18 we've got the boots which i didn't realize have a very interesting pattern on them but i love that we've got the jacket the kind of inside jacket the outer longer trench coat jacket and the trousers are all the same color the hat's the same color as well uh, we've got the shirt with the uh, question marks on it. I don't love them, but I have I have come to love them more um, after the 12th Doctor says that he now has the question marks on his underpants. I thought, yeah, okay, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I think a lot of what Moffat did in his run is make a lot of things in the classic era better. Which, you know, one could argue that isn't the job of a showrunner or a Doctor Who these days, but I think that's certainly, over his seven years, a big credit to him as he fixed a lot of stuff with the classic era. And I think the like, because the Doctor leans into the whole Doctor Who, uh, to the point where he is, you know, still wearing question marks somewhere, you just can't see them, it lends credence to... Well, in the Doctor's vanity, of course he'd have a question mark somewhere. And the Seventh Doctor, who is, well, I mean, the Sixth Doctor is a lot more vain, but the Seventh Doctor, who is, you know, going out of his way to be more mysterious and interesting, of course he's got question marks all over him. Of course he does. Like, why wouldn't he? It looks ridiculous. But <laughs> it it makes sense. It, it And it's in its hindsight. In, in retrospect, it gives you that sense. It does not make sense at the time. But anyway, <clears throat> yeah, this outfit is, I think it is just beautiful. It is gorgeous, rich colours. The scarf is just magnificent. I love it. I love I love everything about this. I love everything about it. Just not Tom Baker's attitude in this entire season. Anyway, so then we move on to the Fifth Doctor. And their first outfit is, of course, the variation on the fourths. So we have the white shirt with the question marks on the lapels. We have a gorgeous designed waistcoat, actually, which is like a bit floral and just a bit psychedelic. And the burgundy trousers. Now, this is a look that... <laughs> Again, I would have loved if this is just what he wore. If this was just the Fifth Doctor's outfit, I'd be over the moon. But no, we have to put him in a cricket outfit. And we have to keep him like that 
for three seasons with no variation. Now it looks like there's a variation here. Uh, it, it, it's oh, that's actually a bit of a variation. I take it back. Well, I'll be darned. <laughs> I just thought it was slightly different. Uh, Colour hues, but no, okay, we actually have a variation. 20 quid, that changes in the 20th anniversary special. So on the left, we have cricket trousers, cricket jumper, a shirt with red lining and question marks on the lapels. Uh, I must say, very fetching coat. I do like the kind of cream with the red lining coat. And a stick of celery. And on the right, the cricket trousers are different. They are markedly different. They are red and white stripes. Whereas the ones on the left are like gold, white with a little red stripe in the middle. The cricket jumper pullover, instead of just having a thick red tick, a little white tick, and then a maroon tick, is two big th thick red ticks with black in between. And it's got two red lines uh, along the bottom as well. And it has green lining. As you can see at the top where it would button up, it's green instead of red. Well, there you go. I genuinely didn't think that changed at all in the three seasons, and that was after looking at this in my head just going, ah, it'll be just a different saturation. But no, yeah, there, there, there you go. That's 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 fun. And then we have the fifth Doctor wearing a ridiculous kind of like Harlequin outfit in Black Orchid. Same episode where uh, he actually uses his cricket outfit. He takes his jacket off and puts on some shin pads and goes and plays cricket now i'm actually a big fan of black rocket i think it's a really really good episode i think it's uh it's a fun 50 minute experiment of pan doctor who still do pure historicals and the answer is yes you just have to be very very careful with it and very clever with it right so the five doctors or the four doctors minus one ah he's still wearing the old outfit so I wonder when he changes. Does he change in Warriors of the Deep? Which is the first episode of his last season. Let's have a wee look. Yeah. It ch nope. No, he's still wearing the other one. But look at Caves of Androzani, and he's got the new one, obviously. Let's go Frontios. And Frontios has got the new one. The Awakening. Oh, apparently that's a movie. That's fun. Well, I meant Doctor Who. Okay, he's, he's got it in The Awakening, at least. Now, oh gosh. I just want to check. Okay, so Warriors of the Deep, he's still got his old outfit, but The Awakening is when he changes. Fine. <laughs> well, there you go. That's that's always fun. Don't don't even change it for the whole season, eh? Just change it for whatever. Um. So, five Doctors. We have... The one and only appearance of Richard Herndl as the First Doctor. First Doctor's outfit, um, very, very similar. The trousers are black, though, instead of the kind of tartan. The, he's wearing gloves. Uh, his face is obviously wildly different. Uh, the black kind of necktie. It looks like we've gone for a, an almost mix between the cream of the Three Doctors and the yellow of his actual era for the waistcoat. But yeah, very obviously the first Doctor. Uh, second Doctor, we've got that uh, kind of red polka dot, uh, what would you call it, handkerchief. Um, you can't really tell with this photo, but it's like greyish trousers with the black suit, uh, muted white uh, shirt and dicky bow. Third Doctor looking as dapper as ever. We've got the red smoking jacket back. We've got the white frilly shirt, which has got kind of like red linings on the frills, no bow tie, and a cape, with which looks like it's that tartan variant from, what was it, season eight, season nine? Yeah, either way. Looking good, looking really good. Patrick Troughton looking more or less the same as ever, probably looking a little bit older, and Richard Herndl looking like Richard Herndl. Then we come to the sixth Doctor. Now the sixth Doctor's first outfit, is the fifth doctor's outfit and it looks fine it looks you know f f fine it's the, it's literally just the fifth doctor's outfit in its entirety obviously they retailed it for colin baker he's a much bigger man than peter davison um does it stick around for long because we have multicolored madness now 
I might be in the minority here. I adore this Sixth Doctor's outfit. I love it. I love everything about it. There is nothing about it I don't like. I love the yellow stripy trousers. I love the shoes. I love the waistcoat that's like two faces different on one side to the other. Actually, no. The only thing I don't like is the like turquoisey plastic for the for his um, pocket watch because it looks like plastic. It, might, it very well might be metal, but it looks like plastic. Uh, I love the blue polka dot tie. I think the quite like he just it's it's bizarre. So if you take the and it happens in um, the two doctors. If you take the uh, the, the 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 kind of patchwork trench coat off. It's quite. It's a dapper look. It's just the colours are all over the shop. It's tasteless, and I love it. I absolutely love it. I look at I look at the Sixth Doctor's coat, and I don't see blue tart and red tart and red there, pink there, peach there. I just see one big mass of yas. Like, I really do. I think it's gorgeous. I really, really do. And I know I'm, like, I'm I'm alone in my house in the fandom. I know I am so, so alone with, uh, <clears throat> with that opinion. But I don't care. I just don't care. I think it is absolutely beautiful. And, well, that's the end of it. <laughs> I really do. I just think it is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, speaking of the two doctors... Uh, we have, of course, the second Doctor and the classic era, the only Doctor to appear in every multi-Doctor story. Um, he's got the the trousers up to his up to his waist again. They are kind of tartany. He's got a, a, a kind of I guess it's the same. It looks like it's the same shirt from the three Doctors, and he's got another dicky bow on. Uh, but he's got like suspenders, which you can see because he doesn't really wear the the black coat other than when you've got the shot of them in the TARDIS. Sixth Doctor, <clears throat> you see that his braces have question marks on as well. Uh, this is an episode where he doesn't wear the big coat, and he's got this absolutely glorious uh, John Nathan Turner Hawaiian waistcoat on, which is, oh, it's, I would love one of those. They are, it looks absolutely stunning. <laughs> then we have uh, a variation. Well, not really a variation. It's like the It's, it's another addition to the sixth doctor's outfit which you only see once in revelation of the daleks uh which is this gorgeous blue uh like overcoat cape thing which is beautiful i think it looks absolutely beautiful it's kind of velvety again you know we've got question marks there because why not uh yeah, and I think it looks really, really good. Obviously, all of this is miles different from what Colin Baker wanted. Colin Baker wanted something more akin to what Christopher Eccleston had, um, because Colin Baker felt that the Doctor would be dark and mysterious and wouldn't be, you know, colourful and vibrant and wouldn't draw attention to himself, basically, uh, which is obviously wildly different to how Jonathan Turner saw it. It is wildly different to how Colin then plays the Doctor and to Colin's absolute strength he still plays the doctor that way today in the big finish audio dramas he's still you know he's still got that kind of arrogance it's just without the maliciousness that you had in season 22 um but he like the sixth doctor looks at that coat and goes this is gorgeous <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I love I he he looks in the mirror and goes, that is a work of art. I love it. Right, who's the bad guy today? You know, and I love that. I absolutely love that about the Sixth Doctor. And you know, I I when I when I watch his episodes, I look past the strangling his companion and the fact that he straight up murders people. <laughs> I, 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 I look past that because because I have to. <laughs> Um, I mean, I shouldn't. The fact that he picks up a gun and kills a Cyberman is is kind of inexcusable. Um, anyway, yeah, lovely. And then we move on to the Seventh Doctor, whose first outfit is a wonderful variation of Collins. Uh, we've got the another another. This is, I think, Colin Baker pulls off the coat. I think Sylvester McCoy doesn't at all. 
the waistcoat is a bit more muted. The cravat is is different. The you know we still got the the white shirt with the question marks. Um, this isn't an outfit we ever saw the sixth Doctor wear. Sixth Doctor wears the same thing in Trial of the Time Lord as well. Uh, this is very much a, a, a seventh Doctor variation. Uh, we then see the seventh Doctor wear a lot of his predecessors' outfits, uh, showcasing that Sylvester McCoy doesn't pull off <laughs> any of them really. Uh, so this is him wearing the Third Doctor's uh, red smoking jacket, white frilly shirt. Uh, looks like he's got the Second Doctor's trousers on. Doesn't work. So he tries the Fourth Doctor's outfit <laughs> with an interesting variation of the scarf. And it dwarfs him because, bless him, he's tiny and it doesn't work. We see him wear the Fifth Doctor's outfit, which doesn't not work. But I'm not sure why they put the the little like the, the knee pads on on him at all. And then we see him wearing a Napoleon outfit, which is very fitting and a very funny joke, and probably would work for him. And then we see just before he uh, unveils what his actual outfit's going to be, he's wearing the big second Doctor coat, and then he whaps it open, and there it is in all of its glory. The heart and trousers held up by red braces. The white uh, jacket with like a very, very small tartan scarf. The white shirt with a, with a tie and a question mark pullover. Uh, slightly better angle, I think, here. Uh, you can see that he's wearing like normal shoes as well. And he's got the question mark umbrella. Now, that changes once in the classic series. In season 26, which is a stunning, stunning season of Doctor Who, I think it's probably... I mean, it is the strongest run in classic Doctor Who, I think, of the 26 seasons. Season 26 is Battlefield is a bit camp and a bit over the top and fantasy and wonderful. Uh, Ghostlight is, I mean, it's a bit muddled, but it's such a, like a character piece, as is Curse of Fenric. Curse of Fenric itself just being a wonderful story and then Survival is is wonderful. All, all those 14 episodes are, are brilliant and I would I would highly recommend anyone go and watch season 26 because I think also you see you see where Doctor Who is going and it's really interesting when you see where Russell T. Davis took Doctor Who in 2005. That's very, very clearly where Doctor Who was going to start going anyway. Russell T. Davis just kind of did it first, I guess, and made it work. Then we've got the... Anyway, I didn't even cover the, the outfit. So... <clears throat> The changes here then is we've got a kind of Kenan esque tie on. Uh, the jacket goes from being grey to brown, as does the scarf that the Seventh Doctor is wearing. Looks a lot better, I think. I think the dark brown works a lot, lot better, uh, especially since this is about the time where McCoy and Andrew Cartmel, the script editor, had, had really started to go to the point where the Seventh Doctor was the darkest, was the most manipulative. Yeah, um, almost, I think the Seventh Doctor at this point starts to become a bit irredeemable. Not, I don't necessarily think it plays to Sylvester's strength on screen. Certainly in audio, he pulls it off brilliantly. But I wonder if a lot of the on-screen stuff is because he's wearing a ridiculous question mark pullover, because the direction and the writing and just the fact it was the late 80s just just hampered his ability. I think when you see him as, as like Radagast the Brown in The Hobbit, that would have been a great version of his Doctor. But obviously that's not the Doctor that, that, that he wanted to play. Um, although in his first season, it's very much a, like to call Patrick Trout a clown. And then you look at Sylvester McCoy's first season. I mean, that's a clown. That is an actual clown. Uh, yeah, anyway, 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 anyway. Uh, in the TV movie, we have a, another variation of the Seventh Doctor's outfit. It's a lot more uh, gentlemanly, shall we say. So we've got the white shirt, we have a tie, we have a red waistcoat, brown jacket, and the hat. And then we move to the Eighth Doctor's beautiful very much classic, classic Doctor Who inspired outfit of curly wig. Uh, white shirt. We've got a kind of black, potentially dark green uh, over jacket. Brown trousers. 
interestingly, it's kind of like brown, but it's got a kind of nice design on it, waistcoat, uh, yeah, white shirt and brown necktie, complete with pocket watch. And that is all of the classic Doctor outfits. So, <clears throat> I about wraps that up. So now we're on to what Sean up to in his life. But it's not about what I'm up to in my life. It's about what I'm reading, watching, playing, and all that fun stuff. Nothing new reading-wise. You're kind of bash with the Oliver Twist, which is just a stunning, stunning book. Uh, watching, just kind of bashing through some British Top Gear. Oh, I'll tell you what we did start watching, actually. We started watching a series of unfortunate events. Um, now, I, I had a lot of problems with the way the book was written. And we tried to watch the film. And, no, I love Jim Carrey. I really, really do. He's one of my absolute favourite actors. But there's some that that film does not suit him at all in any way, shape or form. I think I think of all the films, it shouldn't have been a Jim Carrey film, that should be. So we looked into why <clears throat> the film was you know, as bad as it was. But it turns out that the original director uh, and the original writer for the film, a Daniel Hadler, known better as Lemony Snicket, um, they they left they left the project. Uh, some sources say it's budget reasons. Daniel himself is saying they look. There's no definitive reason. It's just not. Uh, the director wanted to make it a musical, very akin to what the TV shows ended up being. Um, yeah, and and for just a whole bunch of reasons, it just didn't it didn't work out. Uh, they cast Jim Carrey after about ten months of production. Not long after that, they left. Uh, and then Jim Carrey was like, yeah, I'm happy to stay on, but I'd like first refusal on the next director. Not in like an egotistical, I want this to be the Jim Carrey show way, just in a, you know, I'd, I'd, I would love to play this part, but if the original writer isn't involved, and visual director isn't involved, I'd like to, you know, at least have a say in who the replacement is going to be. Um, and then, you know, we got the film we got. And it's, it's, I think it's crap. I think it's, I remember, I loved it when I was younger. I've re I rewatched it a few years ago and still thought it was good. Watching it as the, as the as a Jim Carrey film, it's fine. Watching it as a series of unfortunate events adaptation, it's absolutely bollocks. But the TV show is sensational. Absolutely. So we're let's say two episodes in. So we've just finished the first book. Uh, Neil Patrick Harris is beyond perfect as Olaf. Beyond perfect. The main thing with the TV show, you remember how I said that the director and the uh, original writer for the film left? Well, it's those two that are back. It's the exact same director as executive producer. It's Lemony Snicket himself, Daniel Hadler, who's executive producer, and writes the first few episodes and writes a lot of you know episodes across the whole three seasons. Um <coughs> Yeah, so it's like this is what the original this is what the original vision was gonna be. And it's just wonderful. I think the the actors playing Violet and Klaus are utter crap. Like utter crap. They cannot hold a scene in any way, shape, or form. But it kind of works. It's really weird. It works. I also one of the things I hated about the books was um the mouthwash was very acidic, which here me a word which here means the laptop he was typing on was very loud. A word which here me like reading that is so grating. And uh Jude Law doing it in the film, it was still grating. But casting Patrick Warburton as Lemony Snicket and having him actually appear in the scenes superimposed on and having him underact his gorgeous little socks off, it's just perfect. It is perfect. And that's the thing. One of the things which, which this show has a lot of stuff in it so far, which in any other show I wouldn't like. It's got, you know, some bad acting. It's got some hammy writing. It's got some hammy acting. It's got uh, blatantly obvious CGI shots. It's got very obvious um, chroma key color separation overlay going on. Uh, there's a there's a lot of stuff in it that I normally wouldn't like, but there's just something about the. It is very obviously heightened reality. They they are not attempting to set this in a real world. It is heightened reality. Also, having not finished the books, and obviously when he wrote the film, he hadn't finished the books either. That like, okay, so spoilers for the first two episodes of a series of unfortunate events. If you haven't seen it, uh, cool. Their parents are alive. Now, I, 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 when we watched the, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about it in the books. 
when we watched the film, I went, well, their parents are still going to be alive then because, you know, we're not seeing their bodies. And at the end of the first episode, it's revealed that the parents are still alive. There's this whole secret organization thing. They're like, loads of people have a spyglass, which has this like design of an eye, which is on Count Olaf's ankle. So they're all like connected somehow. One of his henchmen says the word lemony at some point. And he's like, don't say that word, but it sounds like it's just a fun meta thing because there's a few of those. For example, there's a scene where Count Olaf's in the theater. And uh, Mr. Poe's very annoying wife is like, oh, you know, what do you think about theatre dying? And he's like, well, at least it's not a streaming service. Ha 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 ha, because it's on Netflix. And, oh, it's just, it's just stunningly well written. It's stunning. It's so, it's so tight. And every, every actor is pitching it perfectly. No one is overacting. No one is underacting in a bad way. Again, apart from the kids. Like, the two kids are absolute trash. But it works. It's really odd. Like it only doesn't work when they're trying to have an emotional scene together. Uh, then, then like that, that that that'll be a scene that falls flat on its face because those two can't hold a scene together. But when they're just kind of badly acting, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to do this, and like when they're just kind of running through exposition, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. Um, I think the actors in the film were infinitely better, but you know they're probably a bit too old since they'll both be in their thirties at the time that this was recorded. At the time this was recorded, at the time the film was filmed. But yeah, it, it, it's brilliant and it adapts the books very, very closely. It adds stuff in, like it's just little like bits of mystery. So I'm I'm sitting screaming at the TV like, what is that? Who is that? Oh my god, the mum's an inventor too. It's oh, it's just it's so so good. If you haven't watched it and you know nothing about a series of unfortunate events, I genuinely don't know how it would be for you. I really don't. I'm coming at this from someone who, you know, we we read two two books. We were halfway through the third one when, uh, you know, we, we gave up because I just I couldn't stand the way it was written. But I loved the world. I thought the world was interesting, and I thought it was interesting, you know, seeing what the Baudelaire's were up to. And it was, but I started doing my head, and that nobody noticed it was Count Olaf. Uh, but even here, like little change, like they made it, they made a change to Justice Strauss's character from the book to the TV show, which works because in the book, Justice Strauss, uh, you know, she's she has no affinity for acting in any way, shape, or form. She just kind of turns up and does it, and, and you kind of go, "All right, fine." And this, they add in this really interesting backstory of how she wanted to be an actor when she was younger, and but she has stage fright, which comes into it, and the resolution of how they get out of. Uh, so at, at the end of the second episode, at the end of the book, first book, and at the end of the film, actually, um, Olaf's plan is that he's going to marry Violet and take the fortune for himself. That's that's how he's going to get around it, basically. Uh, a whole bunch of legal wrangling, including you know, to get around the fact that she's fourteen years old. Uh, but but it is legal wrangling, which is absolutely sound. It, it's really really well done. The way they get out of it is is there's like a little like technical clause where you know when violet signs the the documentation because she doesn't sign it in her dominant hand is that her sending it in her own hand and the book it's it's re it's written really really well it's a very very tough thing to translate to screen like very very tough i don't think it translates that well but gloriously when klaus is about to go into his whole explanation lemony snicker just takes over and goes this is a really boring explanation and blah, 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 blah. but basically it was very convincing and then it cuts to justice just going well that was very convincing and there's lots of humor like that in it and it's it's brilliant it's absolutely brilliant i've got my fingers crossed also again at the end of the episode we get more uh like there's a lot more foreshadowing going on so the second book we introduced somebody called dr montgomery who's played by billy Connolly in the film who is uh, like a, I can't remember exactly what is, what the term for him is, but basically he has a lot of snakes, um, and he's mentioned in this episode. Uh, his his assistant, who is only named in the book, actually gets is, is appears Mister Poe's secretary. So it's just great, and there's all that there's like this, this like this like network of tunnels that's running under the city which we see Olaf and his theatre troupe go into and, and move around, but there's, like, signs to different people. It's it's just, there's something going on, and I love it, because what you don't get in the books and what you really don't get in the film is this sense of something bigger going on. 
Now, again, having not read the books, what, what kind of me and my wife were thinking after we finished these two episodes was maybe book 9, 10, 11, whatever. There's a whole book dedicated to, well, actually, what I didn't tell you is Klaus picked up a spyglass in book one. Like all that stuff. Um, which I'm I'm glad we didn't because I, I hate when books do that as well. When, when they just kind of tell you this stuff happened, you know, seven books ago. But, oh, well, the writer hadn't thought of it yet, so tough. So translating into TV, it's it's wonderful. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, in terms of what I've been playing, a lot of Nuzlocke started and failed. Started a Shield Pokemon Shield Nuzlocke, failed. Started a Pokemon Crystal Nuzlocke, failed. Started a Pokemon Violet Nuzlocke, which I failed very quickly because uh, there, was a, there was a trainer kind of in the corner somewhere who was like, oh, I'm the toughest trainer in this part of the world. And I'm like, ah, well, you're not going to be that tough. And then he went the floor with me. Uh, I started a Pokemon Scarlet Nuzlocke. Um, I've just beaten the second gym, and I'm on my way to the second Titan. It's going well so far. Uh, trying to what, what's quite interesting about about Generation Nine when you're working to a level cap is there's a lot of experience man like management and trying not to over level. Whereas my problem with a lot of the older games, like Ruby and Sapphire, for example, which both of which I started and failed, is is actually trying to get them up to a level where they're, you know, competitive, competitive, you know, getting them up to a level where, where I'm not going to, you know, have the floor white with me, but without having to spend too long grinding, because I can't, I just, I don't have the, I better say not at the time, I don't have the patience for grinding. Um, Yeah, so it's, it's quite interesting playing, also playing all these games with these, like, different, with this, like, hardcore rule set, which I explained, I explained uh, a couple of weeks ago exactly what that is it does it just adds such an interesting layer to to the way you play the game and resource management and how you spend your money and um, the moves like the, the, the way i play these games has completely changed knowing that if a pokemon faints it's gone and knowing that i can heal in the in the middle of a battle it means I'm using a lot more, th like, you know, I want to put opponents to sleep. I want to confuse them. I want to lower their attacks and defend. Like, I'm, I'm actively looking at other ways to, to inflict damage, and it's, it's just quite interesting. The other thing that I started playing, only the other day, is a game called Ghostwire Tokyo. It's on the, it's leaving PlayStation Plus soon, uh, I think 19th of March. So I was like, well, I'll, I'll give it a go. And it's absolutely fascinating. Story wise, I, I, whenever whenever I start, whenever I get a new game that I'm going to play that I know nothing about, if it's an original IP, uh, I will always skip introduction cutscenes because I want to get to the gameplay, like the difference between a video game and a movie or a TV show or a film or a book is you're you're actively playing a video game. There is there is gameplay. That's what separates it from everything else. That's to me what is the most important thing about a game is what's the gameplay like. Everything else to me is is secondary on a but like a massive massive tear down so i skipped the opening cutscene so i don't really know why there's fog and and why everything's gone a bit haywire and why my guy's got a cut in his hand and has black shroud all over him but the story effectively seems to be uh tokyo's gone to shit and i can somehow help it there's a fog that's like taking spirits uh it's it's like an open world game but the world starts really small and with your exploration, you make the world, you make, you, you, you gain access to more areas. Uh, the combat is really simple, but really cool because it's a PlayStation 5 game as well. It's built with the adaptive triggers in mind. So everything that you do feels really weighty and, and like important and like little things like the, 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 the bad guys that you're, that you're fighting, you hit them a few times and their, like, their spirit core becomes unveiled. And so you hold down the L2 button to grab the core and destroy the core, but there's just a little bit of resistance and you can feel the motor whirring up. When it does, there's just such an amazing like satisfaction feeling. And when you hold when you hold down the R2 button for your normal attack, again, you get that whirring and the vibration and uh, a very, very tiny detail, but I love it. When you jump and you're not next to anything, you jump. When you jump and you're next to something, the hands come out and you vote yourself over. Tiny, tiny detail. Uh, the exploration is really, really fun. <clears throat> uh, when you get hit, it hurts. Like, you're about three or four hits away from death at pretty much all times. Yeah, it's just, it is really, really cool. There's a lot of, like, 
mind-bending psychedelic stuff going on. So you start in a hospital and literally just as you're walking through the hospital, things change in, in front of your eyes. Like it's like ghosts have taken over and, and there's spirits that are moving things around. It's like chairs go that or like the room will flip upside down and you're suddenly you're still walking on the floor, but everything else is on the ceiling. Everything else is and then you're sideways and oh it's 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 uh, if you've got the opportunity to play it, I would one hundred percent give it a go. If you don't have the opportunity to play it, um, but you're thinking you might want to, maybe have a little look and see if there's like some gameplay on YouTube or something, or like a gameplay trailer, because uh, it's 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 fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. There's a lot of like, interesting in, like uh, Japanese culture there as well. There's like a a, flo a floating. I can't remember what they call it. It's like a floating cat with two tails, uh, which is a merchant. Um, and there's like little statues that you pray to, and when you pray to them, you get like extra, uh, like extra magic, so you can use more magic. Uh, I've just got a crossbow as well. It's great. It's 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 such an interesting, interesting game that it's kind of taking me by surprise. It's a lot of fun. It's an awful lot of fun. I say I'd recommend it if if it, if there, if there, if it's there. Um. But yeah, that's it. That's the podcast for this week. <clears throat> um, thank you very much for listening. Um, if you want to get in touch, and it would be amazing if you do, uh, I'm at the SGD Show podcast at gmail.com. Uh, I'm on TikTok with the SGD Show as well. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, then fantastic. Please give it a like, give it a subscribe if you so wish. Um, plop a comment down. What was your favourite Doctor outfit? Remember that part of the podcast? <clears throat> Uh, well, yeah, which which one of the classic Doctor outfits was your favourite? Um, if you're listening on Spotify, give it a little like, give it a little rate. If you're listening somewhere else, if there's somewhere to like it or like give give one or three or nine stars, then that would be amazing as well. Uh, yeah, I'm also at Patreon at the SGD show. I think that's I think that's everything. Yeah, I think that's the podcast for this week. But yeah, thank you very much for listening, everyone. Uh, take care. And I will see you next time.